Our eyes, libertarian, above totalitarians, our guide is the mighty, invisible hand. Jet state controllers, collectors, patrollers, our choices are better than government plans. Taxation is a form of theft. Free markets and free choice are best. Free speech, free movement, free minds and free choice. Our actions are all voluntary, not coerced or compulsory. War we abhor. Socialism does not work. No debt or inflation, no stealth confiscation, no pigs in the trough at the gravy to drink, no state education to brainwash our nation, no experts dictate what to do, what to think. We scorn your fiat currency. Gold and Bitcoin is our money. We own ourselves and we live and let live. I can't remember the next bit. <laughs> uh, anyway, there we go. Those were the words to the Libertarian National Anthem, which I wrote uh, many years ago. So you're a musician and a poet. <laughs> I'm not a musician, actually. Um, I have somebody else writes the music and I write the words for all my songs. And But sometimes I rever reword old songs. I don't reword new songs because it gets you into all sorts of trouble with YouTube algorithms. So I only reword stuff that's out of copyright. And we, <laughs> used, we use the, the Soviet, it's called the Hymn of the Bolshevik Party. We use the National Anthem of the Soviet Union for that because it's out of copyright. And we thought it'd be very funny to have what was written as the Hymn of the Bolshevik Party as the... Uh, music for the national anthem of libertaria <laughs> it is i didn't know that i didn't know that yeah i thought it's like some french revolutionary song or something no, it was composed <laughs> by a guy called alexander alexandrov in whenever it is i guess but it was the hymn of the bolshevik party all right all right so the series is called fit coiners now the question is why are you here and before anything i would like to ask you just to present your results don't tell me what how did you achieve anything just the dry cold hard facts okay so a few years ago i was 92 kilos and i th that was that was in covid it sort of maybe a year into COVID, I, I reached 91, 92 kilos. I was probably a bit heavier before COVID, but I never measured my weight. But so the highest recorded weight was 91, 92 kilos. And then over the next three years, I lost, I got to a low of 68 kilos. So from high to low, I lost 24 kilos. I'm now 70 kilos. So I've lost 22 kilos in total. But also in that time, I'm 55 now and I got my metabolic age from 55 to 49. It's now 50. It's creeped, crept up a little bit. But when I was 92 kilos, I was maybe 52 or 53, but my metabolic age was 58. So I got my metabolic age from 58 down to 49. And things like my general fitness improved as well. and and. But I don't have any, I, I, I haven't got a record of what my heartbeat was, for example, but I know that's much lower. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're interested how that happened, stick to the second part of this conversation. But we must respect the first rule of Bitcoin, which is that you always talk about Bitcoin. Um, let's give the listeners a sense by the question of when did you hear about Bitcoin? Let me just check this. I want to say December 2010. Just for context, while he's looking it up, Bitcoin was invented in 2009. I first heard about Bitcoin on the 4th of January 2011. Uh, I got an email about it from a newsletter that I used to read. Uh, about a guy who was into living off grid and he found an article all, to, all about it um, that was written in a magazine called PC World online. And um, the price of Bitcoin was, I think, 20 cents at the time, something like that. And I read it and I thought, oh, that's a good idea. And then I didn't buy it. And then a few months later, I was quite prominent writing about gold and fiat money and that kind of thing. And a few months later, people started emailing me going, you've got to look at this thing. People actually, in those days, people just give you Bitcoins to get you started. 
And so people gave me Bitcoins back then. So yeah, but that's pretty early, I reckon. The first, what was it? The 4th of January, 2011. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. You might be the earliest adopter I know. <laughs> well, I, I uh, listen, I was an early, I knew about it, but I was not an early adopter because I was stupid, really. I, I just get so many emails and in your mind, all the emails you get rank, they're just the same. You just read them and you deal with your emails. But if I'd actually gone away and researched it, I could have just bought a thousand quids worth and I'd be a billionaire now, probably. Well, I, I, I think you, you're still doing pretty well. Because... I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right, <laughs> but we're never as rich as we'd like to be. The first time I met you, you were the CEO of a company called Cy Fairpunk Holdings, which was a company that was invested in, in, in my project, Wasabi Wallet, uh, or the company behind it, ZK Snacks. Yeah, and that was One... a really good investment for Cypherpunk Holdings. Okay. Have they, still got their shares in, have they still got their shares in your company? Oh, so... No. Did you have to? You had to wind it up because of you were scared of. Uh, yeah, of getting letters from the UN Security Council <laughs> and stuff like that. Okay. You know, it's uh, it, it's it's uh, it's it's problematic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the other company that you have invested in is Samurai Wallet, right? And yeah. where are they now? They are in jail. What's what's your what's your take on this? Uh... Yeah, well, I... I left I left Cypherpunk Holdings um, during COVID. My dad died, and it just it, I had to did I had too much to deal with, so I left Cypherpunk Holdings. And um, so I haven't followed the story very closely of what happened to Samurai and what happened to Wasabi, but I find it very interesting that you know when you fall foul of the police, it's one thing, but when you fall foul of the tax authorities that's when they really, really pursue you. And I've got a theory about the state generally is they're much more in, interested in protecting state property than they are in protecting your property, even though you elect them and you pay them to defend private property rights. Really, you know, imagine if they defended private property, property as they aggressively as they, for example, protect state fines or something like that. But so it's really interesting to me how aggressively they came after the privacy tech companies, the 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 um, privacy wallets, because it shows just what a threat to government revenue they see it to be. And even though taxes you haven't paid them yet, they still see it as their money or as their property. And you know they're pretty aggressive about it. And I found that very telling. Yes, that is very telling. In fact, just yesterday the. Tornado Cash, some news came up. Yeah, they crucified him as well. They crucified him as well, yeah. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see what happens in the US. In the US, some things can happen because at least the US have the illusion of of uh, protecting freedom and you know privacy and stuff like that. In other countries, we don't even have the illusion of that. So maybe, maybe, maybe the battlefield on the legal grounds of the US might might turn out to be better than let's say what happened in the Netherlands with the tornado cash guy right yeah well they don't like like you saw him with the and also telegram they just do oh, not yeah. like privacy tech and for obvious reasons it's a major challenge to them yeah like what are we trying to do you know what do you mean by people having their control over their own money <laughs> so it's, it's wasabi wallet it's literally no more okay so let me let me tell you the story from my point of view uh that's the best i know in december last year there was pressure on wasabi wallet uh, from from all kinds of places uh we had to relocate a couple of times but uh, but eventually i personally decided to 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 stop contributing to wasabi wallet at the point where they started targeting my family so it's it wasn't anymore that my bank account was shut down it was that my family's bank account got shut down right like 
what do they have to do with anything, you know? So that's when I decided to, all right, so I'm going to stop contributing Wasabi Wallet and I gifted away my shares in the company ZK Snacks. And to half him. a year later, samurai guys got in jail and the rest of the ZK Snacks people said that it's enough for them as well. Now, they stopped ZK Snacks, the company, but Wasabi Wallet is still alive, right? It's just there is no funding for it. So there are, there are Wasabi coordinators uh, out there. Different entities are running Wasabi coordinators, and the wallet is developed in a very similar way to Bitcoin Core or Electrum. Okay. Where there is no entity, just open source developers are working mm -hmm. on it. So that's the that's the current state of affairs. Mm -hmm. I'm disappointed because it won't it won't get. Uh, my vision was to make Bitcoin a private money, right? And I knew how to get there. I knew what I had to do to make Bitcoin a private money in a way that the wallet doesn't get in the user's way of doing stuff. So a frictionless user experience and private. And, but, but obviously I need funds for that to, to build a mobile wallet, to, 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 to support all kinds of languages and, and stuff like that. And if you cannot make money from privacy, then you're not going to have funds and you're not going to continue with the development with the same speed as you would be able otherwise. Yeah. Well, how do I put this? It's very like privacy tech does not fetch a very high value in the market. Even like coins like Monero, Monero, you know, in my opinion, they should be worth more than they are, but they, there was one of my experiences working for sci-fi holdings is just, it's very hard to realize value for privacy tech particularly on the basis of users and all that kind of thing that might define value for other kinds of technology because privacy tech by its very nature, <laughs> you don't know how many users there are. So privacy tech, the value of privacy tech tends to be determined by actual revenues uh, rather than blue sky stuff. Yeah, but what was one of the reasons we were compelled by Wasabi is that, you know, the revenues were brilliant. Anyway, yeah. so, so Cypherpunk still got its shares or has it let them go? So ZK Snug, the company have have dissolved itself, right. therefore no, no shares anymore. Um, I think they got more, more dividend out than how much they put in, but obviously this was not the, the hundred X <laughs> bet, you know, that the company that would have been bigger than Microsoft itself because yeah, yeah. could have been, it could have been, it, it, it could have been because this was money and privacy. Yeah, yeah could be built into every single value transaction, value transfer in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not just a, an operating system is, is, is a huge idea, but, or, or search, right? Google is a huge idea, but it's like, Hey, if you're in every single financial transaction in the world, that's, that's, that's orders of magnitude, bigger idea, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, at least, you know, I, I have a, a, a saying I use very often, which is technology is destiny. And so even if you've backed off and Wasabi have backed off and, and you know, you're putting your own safety first and, you're, and all the rest of it, the technology is still there. That is a wonderful contribution that you have made to the evolution of mankind. It, that's, that's, that's how I would like to think about it as well. You know, I, have a, I did not completely give up. I just delayed my evil plans indefinitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, so look, I was really thinking how this can work. And there are only two ways. One is that someone builds a decentralized system like Monero, and that's going to be so good that it takes over the world. And then we are going to have private uninflatable money. No, I don't see this is happening, right? Um, Monero people, Zcash people are claiming stuff, but it's just not usable. And 
there are no incentives to work on it because you get in jail. So, so th this is going to happen in, in the very, very long term. Eventually technology is going to get there, but, uh, but the other way is to build something that is near perfect properties of money satisfies near perfectly the properties of money. It's private, almost free, um, uninflatable and so on. And it is, I know how to build that money. It's just, Hey, um, we had tens of millions of dollars with Wasabi and we failed to get there in time. And then we probably need like a billion dollars to get there. So my personal dream here is to make a billion dollar build a system, a payment system, probably on top of Bitcoin that satisfies the properties of money and build it in stealth mode within a year. And if you release it at all at once, then it's going to take over the entire world, right? Like, like if you, if someone would really build such a system that works out, then it is, there is no, there is no stopping it, you know? So that's my dream. Thank you well, for the interview. What can I say? Go brother. <laughs> I wish I had your coding skills. I wish I had a billion dollars. There's lots of things I would do with a billion dollars if I had it. It will come. It will come. One thing that, that I have to do first is to, we have to solve aging itself. Uh, because it might take a couple of hundred years to get there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's you what I'm working on now. How old are you? 33. Oh God, you're young, 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 young. I'm 55. I mean, I, we should live till we're a hundred. Or thousands. I don't think that'll happen, but maybe. All right. Let's, let's, let's move on a bit to, let's say economics because you're somewhat of an economist are you an economist no no I've read books about money and economics and stuff but i'm, I'm not a qualified economist i'm all self uh -huh, uh -huh. all right so i want to bridge the gap between between health and fitness and 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 bitcoin and i came to the to the chain of thought about methodology so there, there, there is an interesting, interesting way of, um, interesting butters of, of methodologies in, in, in all kinds of fields of sciences. So, uh, the two philosopher, philosophical, uh, lines of, uh, one, you have to get everything from, uh, from axioms and you build out Euclid's geometry, right? Mathematics and stuff like that. You find the ground truths and you build out the great things, but you can also go the other way that you do the scientific method of doing a bunch of experiments and try to, to generalize from specific, um, events, specific species and learn knowledge there. So what is the method of economics? Because economics. The experiments in economics are near to impossible to make, to do. Um, but yet there are results in that field of science. Can you follow me here? Mm -hmm. What are the methods of economics? That's my question to you. Well, I, 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 I'm not sure I'm equipped to answer that question, but what I would say, in my opinion, economics is more a philosophy than it is a science but it's a philosophy that tries to behave as though it's a science. And so they use lots of numbers and so on to make it look more scientific and data driven and so on. But the problem is you can't, like if you're conducting a scientific experiment, you know, you can close off the, the room or you can close off the thing so that no externalities can get in. And in economics, every time, you know, there's some advisory board that says the government's going to make this much money if it does this investment, there's always something that an external thing that, you know, you can't control the externalities and there's always something that it overlooks and forgets. So it, it, in my opinion, it's not a science, it's a philosophy. And, you know, that at one end of the philosophy, you have 
you know, cap, anarcho-capitalist, no government. And then at the other end of the philosophy, the economic philosophy, you have government planning for everything. And the, the world in which we live is, is getting more and more government planning for everything. But generally, the best results come when there is the least possible government involvement and the free market is left to operate by itself and people can conduct their own little experiments. And that is when you get the best outcomes and the most progress and the most innovation and the most invention and so on. That's how I see things. If you look back at history, the greatest societies have always started out at least as the freest. And, you know, it's free markets. The market chooses what is money, free speech, free movement, free choice, all that stuff. It's all it's all under the same header. So that's my little rant about economics. I don't think I've quite answered your question, but I but I hope I have a little bit. But who will build the roads? The same people that build them now. <laughs> You'd really like my song. I have a song called Show Me the Way to An Kapistan. And one of the lines is who builds the roads in Ankapistan. I think you'll find the video fun. I have things to say to that, but I want to move towards towards health and fitness here. Sure. So we also have biology, which is which is interesting because you can have examine says in a petri dish and do some I don't know magical things there, and you're going to get the same results or get a bunch of Uh, humanize mice in 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 together and do experiments although they take like a couple of weeks and stuff but eventually they die so we do the experiments on mice or you can you can take people and do randomized control trials and and well things are getting more expensive but they must be double blinded otherwise there is no results that we can take from that um so if that's the case if we have to have randomized control trials for each and every statement that we make uh otherwise we know nothing then n of one experiments are worthless so we shouldn't even talk about you right now isn't that so i think the funny thing about science and this hopefully follows on you you ask me very profound questions that i'm not sure i'm quite able to answer them a lot of the time but i think the interesting thing about science and it applies to science and it applies to economics as well and it, it certainly applies to fitness and health is that there is stuff that you know you have you have natural law And you have positive law. Positive law is man-made law. And natural law is the laws of the jungle and the laws of nature. And there are things that we have known innately as human beings since forever. And that is why they often feature in our religions. Because religions were a means of controlling people and guiding people and advising people before we had mass media. Now we have mass media, maybe you don't need religion anymore. But so there's all sorts of religious practices, you know, only work, don't work every day of the week, fast, pray, love thy neighbor. All these things uh, are a lot of the time we know them innately because they're part of our belief systems, our religion, a part of our nature. And then science only starts to recognize them and prove them more recently. And so the most perfect example of this is sleep. Human beings have known since forever that it is valuable to have a good night's sleep. You're recharged, your brain works better, your mood is better, you're more capable. We, we know that it's important to sleep well. And yet science is only sort of proving that we need to sleep well in the last couple of years. It's suddenly become really fashionable. And there's all this data that proves that we need sleep. And if you get eight hours of sleep and you get your REM sleep and all that, but we've known it. Like the ancient Greeks all used to talk about the value of sleep. They thought when you dre dreamt, it was a connection with the divine and Aristotle and um, Hippocrates all used to talk about the importance of sleep. We've known it. And yet science is only just proving it now. And yet, and for some pre people, it's only because science has proved it that it has any validity. So that's sleep. and. You know, if you look at money, there's a perfect example here. 
gold has always been money. Gold is the very first metal that human beings used. We used gold even before we could speak. We used gold, uh, alluvial gold was much more common in Stone Age times, and we would find little bits of gold in riverbeds and so on, and we wore it, and we gave it away as a gift, or we gave it away as a reward, or we used it as a tool of barter, and it was a means of displaying status and displaying prowess. Look at me, I have access to this shiny gold stuff. You should reproduce with me. And we've been compelled by gold. Now, gold, you can't destroy gold. Um, and it was present in the dust which formed the solar system. So that little bit of gold that you've got on your ring or around your neck or whatever is not just older than the Earth. It is older than the solar system. And so when you touch that little bit of gold, that is the closest you will ever come to touching eternity. And I've always found that a very profound thought. Now, every society, if there's no government in the way, has always defaulted to gold as money. And every reserve currency in the history of man has started out backed by gold. So gold is nature's money. And, and of course, I'm not just talking about medium of exchange. In fact, gold has never been the greatest medium of exchange. We tended to use silver, copper and other metals as a medium of exchange. I'm thinking more in terms of unit of account and store of value, that, that function of money. And gold is nature's money. And then, so that is natural law, gold. And then human beings come along and they invent fiat money. Fiat is just law. The, the only thing that backs the money is the law and then, and, and, you know, the strong hand of government. So fiat money is positive law. And natural law is obviously gold. And, and one results in much better outcomes than the other, as we all know. I don't need to witter on about the damages of fiat here. Then you take that same mentality. Nature knows the stuff we know innately that science is only just starting to prove. And then you apply it to food. And in my weight loss, I have um, been very careful about what I eat. And in previous times when I've lost lots of weight, I always seem to put the weight back on again afterwards. Whereas this time, I've so far managed to keep it off. It's hard, but I've managed to keep it off. And the big, big change in my diet, I, I fast regularly. And as long as I fast once or twice a week, then, then the weight stays off. And in fact, if I fast twice a week, it keeps on falling off. But the main thing I have avoided is seed oil. And I've got, I got the whole seed oil thing by reading people on Twitter during the pandemic. And there's a sort of alliance between the anti-seed oil people and the pro-Bitcoin people. And if you know the history of seed oil, we've only started using it in the last hundred years in our food. And... Uh, you know, it was initially invented as lubricating oil and other forms of industrial oil. And we've been using butter and lard and tallow and olive oil since forever. These are ancient foods. We know deep, you know, that people were using olive oil in the Bible. We know that these foods are healthy. We don't need science to prove, you know, uh, omega-3, trans, whatever, fat, whatever. We don't need the proof of science to know that these foods are healthy because we've been eating them since forever. Whereas seed oils came along and they got this in the 70s when I was growing up. We were actually told that butter was unhealthy and you should eat margarine. And margarine contained all these hydrogenated fats that contribute to heart attacks and all the rest of it. And they were actually damaging. And it's because basically the people peddling seed oils uh, paid for scientific proof and justified it to governments and then had governments lobbying, you know, telling us that we should eat these margarines and we shouldn't eat animal fats, even though we've been eating them for this forever. So seed oils is, is a new thing in our diet. And they're now realizing that seed oils are, in fact, quite bad for you. And now this whole thing of hydrogenated fats oh well they're the bad ones these new seed oils aren't so bad so there's this this counter argument taking place and there's lots of clever people you know, have done much more research than i have saying that actually some of the modern seed oils aren't too bad well that may be so that may be so but in avoid if you go i'm avoiding seed oils what happens is you find that all processed food contains seed oil so if you go i'm avoiding seed oils you end up avoiding processed food. Now, even if it isn't seed oils that are the problem that's making us all fat, it, and it's something else, whatever it is in processed food, by avoiding seed oils, you avoid it. So it's a really good mantra. 
avoid seed oils at all costs. And even even if the science is now slightly disputed, by like and, and so that's where I stand on that. And seed oils are fiat, in my opinion. They are what fiat money is to money. They are to food. They're that bad. And you know, you look at people in the fifties and sixties. Nobody was fat, and everyone's fat now. And you know, even people who live healthily are. 10, 20 pounds heavier than they'd like to be, five, 10 kilos heavier than they'd like to be. And they're in this constant battle. You know, we exercise more than we exercise in the, in the past. I don't think we're greedier than we were in the past. There's something in our food that is making us sick and obese and giving us all these modern illnesses that never previously existed. And it's either seed oils or it's something that accompanies seed oils. And so my overriding philosophy is avoid seed oils. And you know, some scientists might come on and say, you're talking shit. Fine. It's worked for me. It might not be scientifically proven. It's worked for me. And I am my own little experiment. And I'm happy. I'm a lot healthier in mind and body than I was three or four years ago. And avoiding seed oils has played a huge part in that. I, I need to investigate olive oil more and nuts, but I've definitely found, and again, I don't have the scientific proof. This is just my own lived experience. But nuts, I love nuts. And I love yogurt. And I love putting nuts in yogurt with banana and honey. That is just like, I could eat just bowl after bowl of that. And I've found that if I eat a lot of nuts, even though nuts are healthy, and, and these are nuts without sugar or anything like that, added to, you know, salt or anything, just nuts, I put on weight. So nuts are very calorific. Delicious though they are, and they're supposed to be good for you. They have the right, uh, walnuts especially have the right uh, omega-3. But I find I put on weight if I eat a lot of nuts. So I tend to avoid them now for that reason. But nuts are delicious. And I read this article once, and it was saying, it was talking about bears. And when bears, when winter's coming, bears just consume shed loads of calories to get fat so that they can last through the winter because they know they're not going to have any food in winter. And so they eat shed loads of salmon and they eat nuts, nuts, nuts like mad, and they eat them to get fat. So, you know, sometimes you need to get fat and maybe the nuts, you know, serve that purpose. But, but you, you then, you know, the bears then go through a period of winter where they have no food at all. And so they lose all the weight, but, you know, so you can learn from the habits of bears and for that reason, I think nuts, you know, they are fattening. Olive oil, we've obviously been eating olive oil since forever, but I worry about cooking olive oil in high temperatures. Oh, know, yeah, yeah. A little bit yeah. of, uh, uh, you know, olive oil in your salad or something with bread, delicious. But when you're coating roast potatoes in olive oil and you're cooking your steaks in a lot of olive oil and so on, I, I worry that it's not good for you. The, the way that I conquered nuts is that I have a supplement I have like a, a big supplement uh, bag, let's say, uh, and one of the pockets is like I put it full of nuts, <laughs> all kinds of nuts, and it's around 20 grams of nuts. So I don't eat more nuts a day than the 20 gram that I prepared for myself. Yeah. That's okay. my supplements. Yeah. I just, yeah. I mean, I bought a load of pumpkin seeds recently. I read somewhere that pumpkin seeds are good for. Like I, I pee a lot in the night and I read that pumpkin seeds are good to eat for your prostate or something. And I couldn't believe how calorific pumpkin seeds are. But tell me about, tell me about something else than nuts and seed oils. You've lost 20 kilograms and couldn't be just because of nuts and seed oils. Okay, so I'll tell you, it, I lost 20 kilograms but it, it happened what would happen is you'd lose a bit of weight and then you'd plateau and then you'd lose a bit more weight and you'd plateau and there were certain things that I found helped and the certain things I found didn't help but the the most important thing of all is is diet that's more important than exercise and there's a great saying you cannot outrun a bad diet so it doesn't matter how much exercise you do if your diet is shit you're doomed. So you've got to get your diet right. And I found fasting a very effective way of reducing calories. And there's all sorts of other benefits to fasting. I'm, I'm pretty sure mentally, like on days when I fast, by the end of the day, I'm like, you know, I'm sure my brain is, is, is really on fire. 
I, I sometimes get a bit depressed on days when I fast. So I, I don't fast as much as I did, but, but it helps you reduce calories on, and, and there's a diet called the 16, eight diet where you would eat in eight hour windows every day and then not eat for 16 hours a day. And I found that very hard because I kept, I would keep breaking it two or three days a week. I would break it at which point the diet doesn't work. I found five, two much more effective. So, because on the five days you can do what you like and two days a week, you just reduce your calories to 600 calories. And I found that very effective. But as I say, each to their own. The other thing now, when I'm just trying to keep the weight off, I'm not trying to lose weight anymore. I've, fasting one day a week is, is plenty. But it's a lifestyle thing. I actually enjoy, I look forward to days when I fast. I find it purifying. I just feel better when I fast. Um, and the morning after a fasting day, I call it an inverted hangover because you just feel so fantastic the morning after you fasted. Inverted hangover. That's a great feeling. So fasting was very useful. Um, I, what really, really worked for me, took me to the next level, was cutting down on booze, alcohol. Now, I like drink. I like wine. I love red wine. I love white wine. I like champagne. I love beer. I didn't want to cut down on alcohol. And every time people said you should drink less, I was like, I don't want to. I like drinking. I like the feeling it gives me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a happy drunk. I, I laugh a lot. I'm everyone's best friend. I'm, I go on stage. I make everyone laugh. You know, it's part of comedy clubs and all that. I like booze. I didn't want to cut down on booze. But I got this thing here, a whoop, about a year ago. And what the whoop does is it measures. I got the whoop because I was looking at ways to improve my sleep. But one of the things it measures is your heart rate. And I'm not convinced, by the way, that Whoop's data is accurate. Because when I use other fitness trackers, there's, there's so many inconsistencies between the various fitness trackers. I'm not convinced that they're accurate. So you, a lot of the time you're just storing up data that's just wrong. But in any case, the act of getting a fitness tracker, even if the data is, accurate, is inaccurate, is f f instills good habits in you. So the Whoop in measuring your sleep, it measures a thing called your heart rate variability, which is the gap in time between your heartbeats, how variable that is. And when you drink alcohol, your HRV falls through the floor. It goes really low. When you don't drink, it stays quite high. And my HRV is pretty low anyway. Um, Tell me some numbers. Well, 35, 30, 35, that's when I don't drink. Like I drank two nights ago and it went down to 15, 15, like I'm almost dead. But any, and, and I, but, but I just need to have half a pint or a pint of low alcohol beer, not low alcohol beer, but, but, you know, moderately low. E even if I drink half a percent alcohol, non-alcoholic beer, that's got half a percent in it, it still picks up on it. And so you get this big red, your recovery is really bad thing every morning when you're looking at your stats become really conscious of alcohol so one of the side effects of getting a whoop is that you drink less uh, it's it's not they don't didn't design whoop to make you drink less it's a side effect of it but it's a really beneficial side effect and so i've massively cut down my alcohol sometimes i'll go three or four weeks without a drink and i feel so much better I feel in control of my life. Now, when I do have a drink, I'm really conscious of how bad it is for you. I make better decisions. I am, uh, for example, I, I would come back from comedy clubs and late at night and I would eat loads. I'd just binge eat late at night because I did two or three pints and I'd be really hungry. And basically I'd undone all the good work I'd done dieting by stuffing my face late at night. I don't do that uh, when I don't drink. And so, and then, you know, in terms of, you know, when I was much younger and partying and stuff, and I, I made so many, I mean, I've, I've had a great life and I've had great fun, but I've made so many bad decisions about, you know, who I get off with and stuff like that, all because of booze. And booze, for me, became a substitute for courage. You know, a lot of the time, if I needed to take a deep breath and go up and talk for a girl, I'd just get drunk first. It was a stupid thing to do, but that's what I used to do. I feel so much better than now I've cut down on booze. And but the other thing is it massively, like, never mind the calories from the booze itself. It's the calories from the binge eating that follow the booze. And you get rid of both of those. And that really, really helped my weight loss. So that is category two of my weight loss. Cut down on the booze. We did not talk about exercising. I see you. You're doing some 
dead hangs and doing them for quite a long time, actually. Tell me about that. You seem to fell in love with dead hangs. Well, <laughs> I like sport. And so I play football and I cycle. I play tennis. I swim. I, I did a swimming challenge a few years ago, a cycling challenge. So, you know, I do a wide variety of sport. I'm not a particularly good runner, but I run a couple of times a week. Uh, and and I lift weights once. I'm trying to increase it to twice a week, but I lift weights as well. I, I find weightlifting, the rewards from lifting weights are, are extraordinarily good. They're much more, much better than from doing aerobic exercise. I just don't like it as much, so I don't do it as often, but the rewards from weightlifting are extraordinary. So I really recommend lifting weights at least twice a week if you can. And you just look so much better. But um, I had a motorcycle crash when I was in my 20s and I just knackered my neck. I got whiplash and I knackered my neck. So I've always had problems with my neck. And then when I'm in front of a computer, you know, you jut your neck out like that when you're typing on your computer and it's just so bad for you. And by about a year ago, I just had this trapped nerve in my shoulder and it was so painful. It was the most painful thing ever. I would go and see the osteopath and I was doing everything, but I was just, I was just in so much pain. And I just heard somewhere, I, I had a pull-up bar in my house anyway, but I just heard somewhere that hanging dead hangs were good for your uh, neck problems. So I just started doing them. And because I'd lost quite a lot of weight, I was quite, you know, I'm a good physique for doing dead hangs. If you're like six foot four and you know, 90, 100 kilos or something. It's, it's hard to do dead hangs, but I'm 70 kilos. So, and I just, and like within a week or two, all the problems with my, within my shoulder and my neck cleared up. And I just found them so beneficial. And then they're just so good for you because they just extend the spine and everything you do, sitting or standing or walking or anything, compresses the spine. Whereas dead hangs, they just expand them. And they're just so good for you. And so now, and I've, I've got a pull-up bar in my garden. I've got another one in the hall downstairs. I just try and do one or two two-minute dead hangs a day just to stretch everything out. And, you know, they're very good for your grip strength and your forearms and stuff like that and your shoulders. But so I think in terms of amount of time you put into it, it's very hard to find an exercise that you can do for two minutes that gives you as much benefit as a dead hang does. So I'm, I'm a big believer in dead hangs and they help me a lot. Are you just hanging or you're starting to do like monkey well, hangs, like back I, and forth? I, I, I tend to just hang and I swing from side to side because I like the stretch it gives you through your sides. Um, I, I, I haven't got into one-armed hangs because I read somewhere. <laughs> <It's hard. laughs> well, they're hard. I could do them. I've got the strength, but I read it. it it's quite easy to get an injury doing a one-armed dead hang if you don't do it properly. And the last thing I want is to get an injury that stops me doing dead hangs. <laughs> so, and, you know, I'm 55. You're a bit more prone to injury at 55 than you are when you're in your 30s. So I'm just taking it easy and I do some swings. Um, but maybe I and, – and sometimes I do the dead hang and I grip it like that. Sometimes I grip it like that and sometimes I grip it out wide. So I've got different grips that I can do and I do leg raises and that kind of thing. But on the whole, yeah, I, I don't want to, I, I feel I'm onto a winner with dead hangs and I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> so um, how, how, how do you know it's a pinched nerve? It was just, it was incredibly painful and I Googled it and, and chat GBT would it. And, and then I talked to my osteopath and that's what they decided it was a pinched nerve. What kind of pain was it like sharp? Oh God. It's, like it's very funny. The human, the human mind makes you forget pain. Like a, a year or two after the injury, you forget how painful it was. But I just remember it was extraordinary. It was, it was constant. But if I'm, if I did a movement, it would be really bad. And you felt you had to sort of stay in one position in order not uh -huh. to exacerbate it. And it trapped your movement and it was in my neck. But if you Google trap nerve, it'll tell you what it is. And I just had all the symptoms. Uh -huh. Why okay, do you so think you might have one? No, I just uh, don't really believe people who are saying that they have nerve problems because nerves are pretty resilient uh, as far as I know. So, well, 
I, I've read a lot about these things uh, before because I'm kind of geeking out for for a decade now on a website called painscience.org. Okay. And the, the, the other thing I, sh- I would say is, is if you can see my little, can you see my little fingers not right? Yes. And I injured my little finger playing football once. The, the, I was in goal and the ball bounced uh-huh. and it broke my finger back and I didn't get it properly seen to. And now I have what we call pins and needles in my little finger and it goes all the way up my arm sometimes. And when I had this trapped nerve, it was just like starting in the neck and it was going all the way down the, into, into my little finger. And my osteopath actually thought that the little finger might, be, might have been the cause of it. You know, the Japanese, the ancient Japanese used to cut your little finger off. It's really important to, to you. You don't realize how important your little finger. So it's and even now, my little finger still is numb. You know, it's still not quite right. The, the dead, again, the dead hangs have helped because they improve your grip. Yeah, so that that was another symptom of the of the thing, the, the 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 constant tingling and the weird pains going all the way up and down my arm. Yeah, actually, tingling and numbing are uh, suggestive of nerve problems. So oh, okay, that might be that. Or well, what I wanted to say is that uh, you know about trigger points because you said the massage is helping. So. And and you are talking about referred pain, and that's a very uh, signature move of trigger points. So there are some points in your body that if you if you push, then it's like oh, that's the right point to push. Yeah. You know, uh, once you find a point like that, never let it go. Just keep 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 pushing it for a month. And things are going to get better in your body in different places. So okay. these are trigger points. And, you know, the impor- impor- interesting thing here is that they tend to form around when you have an accident. So if you have an accident uh, and you have a neck problem, then your neck heals and everything. But your the trigger points, those are forming that stay there for many decades uh so well that would so um that would confirm exactly what i told you and and the thing is that massages don't help because they don't push it long enough they they right. don't keep doing it long enough i've been on massages thousands of times i was living in asia you know yeah and 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 they were not solving my trigger point issues. But when I started to massage myself, you know, with little balls and stuff, mm-hmm. and I just kept pushing the, those points, those are hurting, then my pains, my aches just go away. Not all, yeah. but everything that I could find. Mm-hmm. So just hold on to it and keep pushing it. Um one well, one it's a, last it's a useful thing to know thank you pain science dot com mm-hmm. <laughs> um one one last uh last last curiosity here is that are you taking supplements yeah which ones well they vary and um i'm not sure how effective they are but the ones uh i'm taking at the moment are the most effective supplement i've ever taken is bee pollen because I've that I have a problem that I had to take antihistamine for every day. I would have to take an antihistamine, and since I started taking bee pollen, it has natural antihistaminic qualities, so I no longer need to take the white pill. And I'm sure if if it's healthier to take something that nature offers you rather than uh, a white pill. Bee so, pollen. Bee pollen, and in fact, I get my bee pollen from Pul- Bulgaria. <laughs> you know, like pollen. You know, understand you understand pollen. Yes, yes. From, from bees. I have pollen allergy and like I have to take antihistamine like four months every oh, year. Well, you start know? taking bee pollen. <laughs> you, you won't, if, if you take the bee I pollen, look it up. you won't need to take the antihistamine. I look it up. Thanks. So bee pollen. Um, I've recently started taking creatine because I read <laughs> how good it is. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure if it's made any difference. Um, I take, I read, Tonkat Ali and Fadoja. I read that's supposed to improve your testosterone. So I've been taking that. And I think 
It's made me a bit more aggressive when I play football, which is a good thing. And there's another one called Shilijat, which is Himalayan Shilijat that uh, I've been taking. I think it's either that or the Tonkat Alley, but something's just made me a bit more, come on then. And uh, <laughs> so I like that. Then I read somewhere that there was, there's a thing I'm taking for my prostate called Pi Jai Africum or something. I can't remember what it's called. I'm not sure that's made any difference, but I'll finish the, the, the um, tub. Quercetin I've been taking. I'm not sure if that's done anything, but I'll finish the tub. I probably won't bother getting any more. And there are a couple of others that I'm taking that I read somewhere they're good for longevity. I can't remember what they are, but I, I'll just take them until I finish the tub. But I don't think I'll bother buying another tub unless after I stop taking it, unless I notice some kind of regression and then I'll start taking it again. All right. But um, yeah, the, 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 the ones I like are Shilijat, Tonka Ali and, uh, and Bee Pollen. Yeah, I, oh, yeah uh... I started taking recently pine pollen because i had that heard that's good for your testosterone I, do, I don't really like the way it smells or tastes but but um i've heard that's good as well somebody told me uh psyllium husk is good for you so i've started it's good for your oh yeah i was taking lots of things for my gut like bacteria you know you, what do they call it i don't know if that made any difference but i read that psyllium psyllium husk is good for your gut so i've started I've, i bought a packet of that and i'm trying that and um I don't really know that it gives me wind, so I'm not that crazy about it. But 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 I'll finish the packet. Okay, okay. Actually, one of the one of the guy I was interviewing, he also said the same about Sinum Husk that it doesn't work for him. Let's okay. <laughs> let's say it that way. But you know, it's it's basically just fiber, so you can you can replace it. Let's say with inulin fiber. Maybe it's not hundred percent the same, but that's fiber as well. Um, yeah, or apples. Well, not really. I mean, this psyllium husk is is like a lot of fiber, right? Like, yeah, it's a it's a lot compared to like how much you have in in apples. Okay, you know. So anyway, I'll finish the pack, but I probably won't bother buying another. That's an interesting set of supplements. It's uh, it's it's actually quite quite unique. I. I I don't don't often hear these these ones, you know. Even sh sh Shila Jet, you know, the Himalayan yeah. stuff is like it's pretty exotic. When I looked into it, it's like a bunch of diff. It's it's like almost like taking a, a multivitamin. <laughs> it's a bunch of different things at the same package, uh, but well, natural. my my ex girlfriend was really into alternative health and she you know she she's way more clued up than i am and she got me my first little tub and i just liked it so i carried on taking it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. another way that you could target your testosterone if you're not targeting your testosterone but you're targeting other hormones like you do you do a, a blood test and you check other hormones like DAGAS. And if you're low on DAGAS, then you take DAGA and then it's going to pump up your blood levels in DAGA and that's going to help your testosterone as well. So that's an interesting strategy some okay. people are doing. Well, I did some blood tests and some testosterone. My testosterone was actually quite high. I had higher testosterone than my son. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this was before I started taking all the supplements. But, um, you know, I just like. I like, you know, come on. I like being like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Do you do anything extra like red light therapy, sauna, cold plunge or carnivore sometimes? Um, sometimes I do uh, breathing every morning. I go and sit every morning. I sit for 15 minutes in the sun. And sometimes I do a Wim Hof breathing exercise while I'm doing it. Um, not every day, but maybe five times a week, four or five times a week. I do some neck exercises, try and do those every day. I do a dead hang every day. I've started getting into um, pelvic floor exercises. I try and do those every day because they stop me peeing in the night. Um, I do a gratitude diary every day. That really helps with my, makes me grateful for things. I've been going to bed earlier. I've been trying to sleep for longer. And 
I got quite interested in the last couple of weeks in the third eye and the pineal gland. And uh, I, my ex-girlfriend was telling me how it gets calcified because we have too much fluoride fluoride in water so i started drinking bottled water i worry about bottled water because then you get the plastic but i don't know you can't win so i tried to reduce my fluoride and then i was when i was asleep i was playing frequencies that open up your third eye and i don't know if they had any effect or not but a couple of times weird things have happened the day after i've had a night listening to these high frequencies one time I had an extraordinarily vivid dream that I now think I was actually paid a visit by somebody, you know, a family member who died a year ago. It's just, I don't know if they've done any good or not, but, but so I played those frequencies and I don't know, something, something happened. But I, 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 I've never been, I've always had a lot of sympathy for spiritual people and I've been a big believer in all that spiritual stuff, but I've never actually been able to activate it myself well maybe you'll figure out how to i'd like now. to i'd like to so that i can find out i'm sure it would help me with my investments <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure well bitcoin is not gonna not gonna hundred x anymore so maybe new opportunities are are to be looked forward to yeah i think i think i like the way i like what bitcoin's doing at the moment I obviously would like it more if it had gone up more. We're going into Q4, which is the best Q of the year for Bitcoin. Uh, I think like of the last 12 years, like seven Q4s have been positive and the average gain is 90%. So we could see 100K this quarter. It always does well in election years, apparently, as well. So that's good. Um, I'd like, I'd like. I have a target of 150 on this cycle, but I don't see why it can't get to 200. Um, but each double is more difficult than the last. I do think Bitcoin needs a, a new story to ignite it a little bit. Michael Saylor is the main storyteller in Bitcoin, but he was, I mean, I think he's a genius. I love him. But he was the the main storyteller in the last cycle. And I think it needs a new storyteller. But I think the growth is going to come Instead of from retail buying, I think all the retail people who are going to buy Bitcoin have pretty much bought it, or maybe half of them have. I think the next big driver is corporate and uh, maybe even national buying. And I think they'll be reluctant to do that because they don't want to enrich all those horrible uh, citizens who are early adopters, but they may have no choice. It's such an obvious problem solver for all those um, Asian nations looking to de dollarize, but at the moment it looks like they're doing some kind of gold back. CBDC of some kind, but Bitcoin is an obvious problem solver for them. Now, let me ask you my closing questions. So there is one question I ask from everyone. Are you familiar with Peter Thiel's contrarian question? No. Okay, so I, I think this is the best question in the world, but uh, I'm just gonna pose it to you. So what's one thing that you strongly believe to be the case? but very few people agree with you on. That fortune telling and tarot card reading and all that has a value. That's one. And two, nature and genes and family thus and thus think, even things like race because they're part of nature and genes and family and everything else, are probably more important than nurture. What goods and services do you provide in the marketplace? <laughs> uh, I've really enjoyed this interview. Thank you. Um, I have a newsletter called The Flying Frisbee which you can subscribe to at theflyingfrisbee.com. There's a free, it's free, but then there's a paid one if you want to upgrade and get the really valuable stuff. It's a Substack basically, Flying Frisbee, and it's very popular in the UK and it's doing very well. And I'm, I'm writing fitness and finance. So I'm writing on Sundays, I tend to cover my health journey and midweek I do some kind of market commentary. My main stuff is anti-fiat, pro-Bitcoin, pro-gold. And 
So that's one service. And then if you like me for my comedy songs and my comedy, that's the other service that I provide to the market. Please come and see me perform and please subscribe to my comedy newsletter, which is DominicFrisbee.com. And there you can see my videos. I release them to my newsletter readers before I put them out uh, on YouTube and so on. And the last one, I had one earlier in the year, We're All Far Right Now, uh, which Elon Musk shared. He's one of my fans. He follows me on Twitter. And uh, that got 50 million views and it's uh, proved very popular. So when I do, a, and obviously the Libertarian National Anthem, and uh, when I do a video, sometimes, yeah, they go viral. Not always, not as often as I'd like, but sometimes they go truly viral. 50 million views is pretty good. Dominic Frisbee, poet, musician, comedian, ex-CEO of an uh, investment company, early Bitcoin adopter, financial commentator, and from today's on, a fitness influencer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It's been, I've really enjoyed it. I'd love to come on again soon, whenever you have me.